The Church of Ireland is a member of the Anglican Communion, in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Shortly after King Henry VIII of England separated the Church of England from the papacy in 1534, becoming the supreme head of the church, Ireland in 1537 passed the Irish Supremacy Act, giving the King of England supremacy in the Church of Ireland as well. In 1792, an organization called the Association for Promoting Christian Knowledge was founded in Ireland, and they self-identify as linked to the Church of Ireland but independent from it. The Church of Ireland hosts many articles from the APCK that I will be referring to in this video. APCK's booklet Irish and Universal says, Did the Church of Ireland begin at the Reformation? No, the Church of Ireland is that part of the Irish Church which was influenced by the Reformation and has its origins in the early Celtic Church of St. Patrick. Beginning in 1800, the Church of Ireland was united with the Church of England as the two countries were politically joined in union as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Though the two countries would remain joined until the 1920s, in 1869 the Irish Church Act was passed, which divided the Church of England and Church of Ireland, and set in motion what came in 1871 when the Church of Ireland was disestablished from being the state church. A decade before the disestablishment, in 1861, a census revealed that the Church of Ireland was not the majority religious group in any of the 32 counties of Ireland. Only one-eighth of the population identified as members. The pamphlet Irish and Universal says, In the 19th century, at the time of the disestablishment of the church, its property was confiscated by the state. However, schools, churches, and cathedrals were given back and remain in the possession of the church to the present day. The church today has congregations in the Republic of Ireland and in Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. In the Republic of Ireland, the church is the second largest after the Catholic Church, and in Northern Ireland, it is third largest behind the Presbyterian and Catholic Church. On the What We Believe page of the Church of Ireland website, they say, In keeping with Anglican theology, our practices derive from scripture, reason, and tradition. We are Catholic in holding all the Christian faith in its fullness and being part of the one worldwide Church of God. We are reformed in believing that the Church's life should be aligned with scripture and that the Church should only require its members to believe those doctrines to which scripture bears witness. They also say, The Book of Common Prayer is a source of unity within the Church and an expression of a liturgical language, traditional and modern, which over the years has captivated people by its beauty and spiritual power. They say in the pamphlet Liturgy, the Church of Ireland expresses its liturgical tradition in the Book of Common Prayer, BCP. In the first BCP of 1549, Cranmer drew on previous riches of liturgical worship going back to the earliest church. The Book of Common Prayer is a key part of all Anglican tradition churches, and the Church of Ireland is no exception. The written liturgies for various services, prayers, thanksgivings, the calendar, catechism, and more can be found inside. The Church is Trinitarian and affirms Christ's deity, virgin birth, resurrection, and heaven and hell. As APCK says, the Church of Ireland emphasizes the importance of the sacraments. It administers the two gospel sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, as well as the sacramental ministries of confirmation, ordination, holy matrimony, absolution, and healing. So there are two primary sacraments, but the other five may also be referred to as sacraments. The Catechism in the Book of Common Prayer also says, How many sacraments hath Christ ordained in his church? Answer, Two only, as generally necessary to salvation, that is to say, baptism and the supper of the Lord. On baptism, APCK says, Baptism can take place at any age. In the Church of Ireland, most people are baptized as infants. Those being presented for baptism have water poured on their heads. Water declares God's presence in the life of the candidates and signifies that they become God's adopted children and members of the Church. The sign of the cross is made on the forehead as a visible sign of belonging to Christ. On confirmation, it is said, Confirmation is the rite at which those who have been baptized seek the blessing of the Holy Spirit for their growth as Christians. The confirmation candidates first confirm the promises of their baptism. Then the bishop lays hands on them, praying that God's Spirit will confirm, strengthen, and guide them to live out their faith in their everyday lives. In some parts of the Anglican Communion, individuals who have been baptized do not have to be confirmed to receive Holy Communion. In the Church of Ireland, admission to Holy Communion has usually presupposed confirmation. On private confession, they say, it is often rightly said of the ministry of private confession that all may, some should, none must. This ministry is normally available on request, either in the church or in a less formal setting. 
On the Eucharist, the Church says, We regard worship as a priority for every Christian. In particular, we see the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, as the main way in which Church members celebrate their love for God and for each other and become renewed as the body of Christ for mission and service. The APCK article on the Eucharist says, In receiving His body and blood, we are strengthened in our union with Christ and His Church. We receive the forgiveness of our sins, and we are nourished for eternal life. They also state, The Church of Ireland teaches that there is no change in the physical properties of the bread and wine. However, there is a change in the significance they have for worshipers. Through them, the life of the risen and glorified Christ is communicated and received by faith. Thus, following consecration, they are considered as Christ's sacramental body and blood. It is the glorified Lord himself whom the community of the faithful encounters in the Eucharistic celebration through the preaching of the word, in the fellowship of the Lord's Supper, in the heart of the believer, and in a sacramental way through the gifts of his body and blood already given on the cross for their salvation. The most common view in the church on the presence of Christ in the elements is that his body and blood are truly present in the sacrament, but without a desire to specifically state how this happens, in contrast to, for example, the doctrine of transubstantiation. However, there is an openness to differing views, and so not all in the church view things the same way on this issue. They also say, communicant members of other Christian churches may receive Holy Communion in the Church of Ireland. The Church holds to a 66-book canon of Scripture. APCK says, The Church of Ireland considers the Apocrypha as worthy of reading by the Church, for example, of life and instruction of manners, but not for establishing doctrine. On the relationship of Scripture and tradition, APCK says, Christians must keep returning to the Bible as they continue to explore the truth of God, for Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, Articles of Religion 6. The Church of Ireland believes that the Church's teaching must be founded on and consistent with Scripture. We also have a responsibility to use our reason in understanding the Bible in the context of tradition, which is how the Church's interpretation of Scripture has developed. The Church does not require ministers to affirm the Bible is inerrant, and many do not. The APCK pamphlet, Making Moral Decision says, For many Christians, the cultural context of the biblical writers seems to have resulted in rulings we would rightly call into question today, in the light of Jesus' central command to love unconditionally. Attitudes in the Mosaic Law to enemies, slaves, and women, together with punishments such as stoning for sexual transgressions, are cases in point, so we need to consider how we read the Bible. On creation, one person of significance to the Young Earth Creation Movement hailed from the Church of Ireland. James Usher was the Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of All Ireland in the 1600s, and he used biblical genealogies and events that could be synchronized to known historical dates to calculate the creation to around 6 p.m. on the 22nd of October 4004 B.C., the approximately 6,000 years ago date still used by Young Earth adherents matches this date. However, for most in the Church of Ireland today, the Young Earth position is viewed disfavorably. For example, take now-retired Church of Ireland rector Ron Elston, who also had a career as a geologist at University College Dublin. In a 2016 talk on the topic In the Beginning, he presented the view that the ancient text of Genesis 1 is not science, but it continually describes the goodness of God's creation, human relationships, not human biology, and polemics arguing for a structured development in stages that can be understood as progress. Elsden has also said, the vast majority of scientific evidence from a huge number of different sources points to the fact that the earth is very, very old and not very, very young. It's evidence from biology, chemistry, physics, geology, astronomy, you name it, the evidence all points in the one direction. The Church teaches the doctrine of original sin, as stated in the ninth of the 39 articles, Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, as the Pelagians do vainly talk, but is the fault and corruption of the nature of every man that naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam. However, not all in the Church view things the same way. In a 2014 issue of the Church of Ireland Gazette, Reverend Stephen Neal said that original sin is, quote, one of the biggest elephants in the room in Christian and especially Protestant theology, unquote, and a, quote, distortion of the divine human relationship and indeed the relationship between humanity and the rest of creation, unquote. The article was controversial. On salvation, it is stated, We need salvation because we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3.23. We have denied, ignored, or rejected God's love, both as individuals and as members of society. We have all sinned through action and inaction and have, as a result, damaged others, ourselves, and the world around us. The benefits of salvation extend beyond essential healing and forgiveness to include a state of wholeness and liberation from all that is evil in our world. 
In addition, salvation entails the fulfillment of our true human potential, enabling us to overcome the transience and mortality of earthly life. Salvation means experiencing the fullness of life in God just as He intended. The promise of salvation is that we and creation will be in true relationship with God through Jesus Christ, in which sin and its consequences will be no more. This is the life in all its fullness that Jesus said he came to bring, John 10.10, as portrayed in the vision of a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21 and 22. As Christians, we experience a foretaste of the reality of this salvation on earth. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we have a deepening awareness of the presence of God in our daily lives. Our lives are changed as we forgive and receive forgiveness, and as we seek to live as followers of Jesus, working out our salvation in different areas of our lives. We join with others on the way of salvation salvation as a new community of faith and love, an alternative society which seeks to challenge the self-centered values of the world and to model life as God intended it to be. At least that is the theory. In practice, we know that our transformation is not yet complete and that sin continues to deflect us both individually and corporately from the path of holiness. We continue to press on toward the goal, Philippians 3.14, aware that we will not fully attain it in this life. The Christian experience of salvation has always been a combination of the now and the not yet, the gift of God which we have received and seek to live out in our daily lives, knowing that the best is yet to come. Part of the Catechism in the Book of Common Prayer says, Question. Dost thou not think that thou art bound to believe and to do as they have promised for thee? Answer. Yes, verily, and by God's help so I will. And I heartily thank our Heavenly Father that he hath called me to this state of salvation through Jesus Christ our Savior. And I pray unto God to give me his grace that I may continue in the same unto my life's end. The church does not explicitly hold to theology that is either fully Calvinist or Arminian. Most, but not all, would deny a once saved, always saved viewpoint. However, there is room for differences on these matters. The church doesn't teach an entire sanctification experience. The Church of Ireland is mostly not charismatic, though there is no explicit condemnation of charismatic theology in their documents. There have been and still are charismatics in the church. In a 2016 theological report, it was stated, the Church of Ireland has not made a pronouncement as to whether it believes that God still gives Christian people the gift of prophecy or whether this is a gift which ceased after the end of the apostolic period. But what it believes about healing and other spiritual gifts suggests that the Church of Ireland does not rule out that possibility. Indeed, at Church of Ireland confirmation, there is a prayer which asks God to send his gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit to the candidates. On eschatology or end times views, the Anglican view held by those in the Church of Ireland is mostly amillennial. Events taken as literal by premillennialists like a thousand year millennium or a tribulation period are not taught. Rather, Christ will return and then will be final judgment. Dispensational premillennialism, which would be considered an unorthodox position in the church, owes its popularity to a former Church of Ireland priest, John Nelson Darby, whose influential work among the Plymouth Brethren pushed this view into the mainstream. He became convinced of this view after leaving the Church of Ireland over other issues. On marriage, Canon 31 of the Church says in part, The Church of Ireland affirms, according to our Lord's teaching, that marriage is, in its purpose, a union permanent and lifelong, for better or worse, till death do them part, of one man with one woman, to the exclusion of all others on either side, for the procreation and nurture of children, for the hallowing and right direction of the natural instincts and affections, and for the mutual society, help and comfort, which the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Within the church, same-sex marriages are currently not permitted to be performed. In 2011, a Church of Ireland minister joined in a civil partnership with his boyfriend and remains in the church to this day. In the 2016 book, The Guide, by the Select Committee on Human Sexuality in the Context of Christian Belief, it is stated, Our church is facing a profound challenge. There is a strong demand that the church should change its teaching. There is a strong insistence that the church's teaching on marriage is biblical and should not be altered because it has become unpopular in wider society. The controversy has caused deep division within the Anglican Communion and within the Church of Ireland. On cohabitation, APCK says, what we now call cohabitation was considered acceptable for much of Christian history before ceremonial marriage became the norm in the 19th century. It is, once again, a social reality to which the church's previous attitude is currently being debated. The bottom line in any view of cohabitation has to be the intention of the couple to lifelong loyalty and faithfulness within their relationship. Remarriage of divorcees in the church was not allowed until 1996. Today, prior to a remarriage following a divorce, the clergy person is to inquire about the following. 
evidence in the parties of an appreciation of the Church of Ireland teaching about the nature of marriage and its lifelong intent, the present connection of the applicants with the Church of Ireland, the grounds on which the annulment or divorce was granted, evidence that adequate and proper provision has been made for any previous partner and for children, if any, whether due efforts toward reconciliation were made before separation proceedings began, whether the applicants have a firm intention to sustain their proposed union with the help of God and the church. This information is then to be given to the bishop to inform whether the marriage will be allowed to take place. If so, a service for preparation for remarriage in church is held. As part of that service, the priest will ask, Acknowledging the breakdown of a former covenant of marriage, will you together pray for God's strength to fulfill in love and faithfulness the vows you are about to take? On abortion, in March 2020, a statement was posted on the church website which said, New regulations now to be implemented mean that anyone can ask for their pregnancy of up to 12 weeks to be terminated without the need to provide any reason. As a church, the Church of Ireland has always opposed this. The new legislation most shockingly permits abortion right up to birth where, if the child were born, it would suffer such physical or mental impairment as to be seriously disabled. As followers of Christ, we believe that all are made in the image of God. All are of inestimable value, and in society and in our churches today, we rightly try to ensure that all are valued and none discriminated against. This piece of legislation has to be deeply upsetting for the many disabled who we love and value and who contribute so much to society today. In 2021, the Standing Committee of the General Synod approved a resolution which stated, We oppose the extreme abortion legislation imposed on Northern Ireland by the United Kingdom Parliament in what was previously considered a devolved issue and ask that legislation is developed that safeguards the well-being of both the mother and unborn child. In addition, we encourage our church to provide more support to mothers during pregnancy, particularly during times of crisis. On worship style, they say, The Church of Ireland maintains a liturgical pattern of worship, observing the feasts and fasts of the Catholic liturgical year. It remembers the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints on special days. It retains many of the rites and ceremonies of the pre-Reformation Catholic Church. The Church of Ireland has within its fellowship religious orders of men and women, under the traditional threefold vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. The Church of Ireland has retained the structure of the pre-Reformation Catholic Church and is no stranger to words like parish, bishop, diocese, priest, sanctuary, confirmation, Eucharist, synod, and to all for which they stand. Many congregations meet in old historic and ornate church buildings. A small number of churches offer services in the Irish language, but the vast majority only hold English services. The church does not prohibit alcohol, but it does speak on the issue. They have said, Ireland has a problem with alcohol. The consumption rates are high and there is a prevalence of binge drinking compared with other countries, except the UK where rates are similar. The biblical and theological findings, as well as church tradition, however, make it clear that alcohol, and particularly wine, should not be totally condemned. It can be a source of conviviality and social relaxation. What we must encourage is temperance in the sense of restraint and self-control to avoid overindulgence. When the Church of Ireland was the state church, all the people of the state supported the church through tithes as required by law, even though the church was often not the church of most who paid into it. Today, tithing language is still sometimes used. The church's booklet, Live to Give, produced for the church's generous giving program, says, Tithing is a biblical principle where we give 10% of our income back to God. On Mary's Immaculate Conception and Corporal Assumption, APCK states, The Church of Ireland teaches that neither Holy Scripture nor the understanding of the scriptures by the early fathers of the church support these doctrines. And also, the liturgical tradition within the Church of Ireland has been to honor the saints, including Mary, without invocation. In other words, while we honor Mary, our prayers are offered only to God. However, they also say, Mary's special position within God's purpose of salvation as God-bearer, Theotokos, is recognized in a number of ways. Some of these ways include church calendar days in honor of Mary. The church claims to be both Catholic and Protestant. APCK says of this, is the Church of Ireland Protestant or Catholic? It is both Protestant and Catholic. For this reason, it is incorrect to refer to members of the Church of Ireland as non-Catholic. The terms Protestant and Catholic are not really opposites. There are Catholics who accept the universal jurisdiction of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. Often in consequence, they are called Roman Catholics. But there are other Catholics who do not accept the Pope's jurisdiction or certain doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Some are called Protestant or Reformed Catholics. Among them are members of the Church of Ireland and the other churches of the Anglican Communion. It follows, therefore, that the terms Protestant and Reformed should be contrasted with Roman and not with Catholic. 
Anglicanism has a scale from more reformed and low church on the one side to the Anglo-Catholics and high church Anglicans on the other side. Most commentators commenting on this spectrum within the Church of Ireland particularly view it as one of the churches on the Anglican tradition that leans more heavily to the Protestant elements of the church than to the Catholic ones. That's not to say that there is still not a variety because there certainly is. There is some congregational involvement in church function. In clergy and people, APCK says the lay persons elected by the general vestries of all the parishes of the diocese together with the clergy sit on the diocesan synod. This synod meets under the presidency of the bishop and has responsibility for many aspects of diocesan life. Clergy and laity vote in the church's general synod. They say that the church is thus referred to as episcopally led and synodically governed. On church offices, they say, we affirm the ancient threefold ministry of bishops, priests, and deacons. As an Anglican denomination, they claim that their bishops are ordained in a succession from the apostles. Women are ordained to all church offices. The first woman deacon was ordained in 1987, the first priest in 1990, and the first bishop in 2013. Today, about 20% of priests are women. Since 1995, the church has been part of the Porvu Communion, a group of European, Anglican, and Lutheran churches in communion with each other. It is also a member of the Irish Council of Churches, Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, Conference of European Churches, and the World Council of Churches. The church is not part of the Global Anglican Futures Conference, or GAFCON, but in 2018, GAFCON did hold a conference in Ireland, and a six-member delegation from the Church of Ireland was present, including two bishops in a non-official capacity. Now let's look at the statistics of the church. These are generally counted separately in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. In the Republic of Ireland, the 2016 Faith Survey showed that 78% were Catholics and 9.84% no religion. The next largest church behind Catholics is the Church of Ireland, but it's a far distant second place at 2.65%, or 126,400 members. Between 2011 and 2016, adherence to the Church of Ireland dropped 2%, while Orthodox went up by 37.5%. Orthodoxy in Ireland has grown to be about half the size of the Church of Ireland. In Northern Ireland, 2011 statistics showed the Catholic Church had 41%, Presbyterians were 19%, and the Church of Ireland had 14%. The Church claims 275,000 members in Northern Ireland. Between both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, a 2013 internal census showed that there are around 1,300 weddings conducted each year, 3,700 baptisms, 2,300 confirmations, and 3,500 funerals. 57% of worshippers are female and 43% male. Of course, with the congregations it has in Northern Ireland, the Church of Ireland is one of the many denominations with a presence in the UK. Click here to watch my video that compares and describes over 80 UK denominations, Church of Ireland included.